Perfect transition after Dave's talk, he showed that there will be many currencies. So we decided that we would also tell you the story of one of these currencies. And if you've never heard of Bitcoin, you're going to hear the fascinating story of one of the first peer-to-peer -peer currency. She flew from New York to speak to you today. Uh, she's a journalist. Please help me welcome Adrienne Jeffries. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Adrienne Jeffries. I'm a technology reporter in New York City. And I'm going to tell you about uh, Bitcoin, which was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation. Um, so uh, we'll start the story when I first learned about Bitcoin, which was in June 2011, uh, when an American news blog called Gawker wrote this story uh, called The Underground Website Where You Can Buy Any Drug Imaginable. And the story was about a website called Silk Road, which sold drugs and other things that some governments might consider illegal. And people were buying them with an anonymous currency called Bitcoin. So you can imagine this story hit hard. It was uh, kind of blowing up for a week. A lot of people were talking about it. Some senators got involved and called for an investigation. Um, but it was kind of funny because Silk Road is really hard to get to. Like, it, it has a really long address, and you can't just go directly to the site. Um, so people sort of forgot about Silk Road. But uh, for some reason, they were like, really excited and interested in Bitcoin, the money that people were using on Silk Road. Uh, so what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is like a good way to introduce it is imagine that uh, Imagine there's a global currency um, for the internet. Uh, you don't need a bank. You don't need a credit card. You don't need to tell anyone your address. Um, you can just uh, send these virtual coins. It's like virtual cash, basically. Um, and uh, you can imagine this could be pretty disruptive. Um, so uh, Bitcoin is totally decentralized. There's no central authority, um, and uh, there's no regulator. Um, everything, that the technology, everything that the currency needs to do is built into the code. So the technology is the regulator. So it's kind of anarchist. Um, so this is the central document for Bitcoin. This is the Bitcoin white paper, a famous Bitcoin white paper, uh, which was written by Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a fake name. Uh, Bitcoin was actually evaluated by uh, Dan Kaminsky, who is a top internet security analyst, and he uh, looked at the code and he said this was written by a world-class programmer. He could find no uh, major security flaws, and uh, he said it looked like it had also been evaluated by a third party and that it had had some input from quants, like uh, finance nerds who work on Wall Street. Um, so Satoshi was very... Uh, visible in the beginning of Bitcoin. No one from the Bitcoin community had actually met him or her, but uh, he was posting on forums and uh, emailing with people, uh, especially with Gavin Andreessen, uh, this guy who's trying to set money on fire, who is the lead developer on the Bitcoin project. But uh, in April, um, Satoshi sent Gavin an email saying he was moving on to other things, and he disappeared from the internet completely. No one's heard from Satoshi since April. Um, and there's a conspiracy theory that Satoshi invented Bitcoin and uh, made a bunch of Bitcoins in the beginning and just cashed out. Um, so Bitcoins are created uh, by running a program called a Bitcoin miner. Um, you can do it on your computer. Uh, basically, um, you, uh, you run this Bitcoin miner uh, on your computer. And in the beginning, there were no Bitcoins, and it was really easy to make one. You could like set the computer running and then go make a sandwich and come back and you'd have a Bitcoin. But as time went on and the uh, total number of Bitcoins increased, it became more difficult to make a Bitcoin and it now takes several days uh, de depending on, um, on how powerful your computer is. And it was actually designed this way. Um, so this is one of the ways that Bitcoin regulates itself. It regulates its own money supply. Uh, the num total number of Bitcoins is also capped at 21 million, although it's divisible. So these are some homemade Bitcoin mining rigs. 
so the, what the Bitcoin miners are doing is actually creating a long transaction log of all the Bitcoin transactions, which is another way that Bitcoin regulates itself. So when you buy or sell something in Bitcoin, it has to get verified by a miner. And then it goes into this long log that ends up being a history of all Bitcoin transactions ever. So this prevents people from spending the same Bitcoin twice, for example, or from reversing transactions, which is something that is unpopular about current e-payments uh, solutions. Um, so around the time that people started to become aware of Bitcoin, it had actually existed since 2009, but uh, in the summer was when people in the mainstream started to become aware of it, and there was a bit of a gold rush. So people started mining a lot of Bitcoin. Other people who didn't want to mine Bitcoin started buying it. And Bitcoin exchanges where you could buy Bitcoin for yen or for dollars or euro or whatever started popping up. And uh, the price of Bitcoin started to go way up. So this is when Bitcoin peaked. It was uh, at 33 US dollars to the Bitcoin, which if you're not familiar with US dollars is about 24 euro. Uh, so it was really expensive. And so then the press started to pay some attention. Uh, the currency that's up 200,000 percent, um, WikiLeaks started asking for Bitcoin donations, so they would be a little anonymous, um, although uh, Bitcoin is not totally anonymous. Um, what is Bitcoin, the private digital money that everyone is talking about? Uh, the Economist, very serious, wrote a very serious article about it. And this is when I started to think, hmm, maybe I should get some Bitcoins. Um, so I started to get a little bit obsessed with Bitcoin, was reading about it, writing about it a lot, uh, staying up late on Bitcoin IRC channels and talking to people about it, and I decided to buy some. So I took orders from my friends. My brother wanted two, my editor asked for one, uh, one of my coworkers asked for one, and I decided I want two for myself. So I went to this place, uh, which is a delicious Mediterranean restaurant called Meza Grill, which is 10 minutes or so from my office. And the owner of Meza Grill is like a Bitcoin guy. He got really into it and decided to start accepting Bitcoin at the restaurant. So he was selling like pitas for Bitcoin and then he realized he could actually, he could sell Bitcoin too, just for cash. So I went in with about 90 bucks because at the time it was $15 to the Bitcoin. And I got the Bitcoins and I stored them at a website called My Bitcoin, which was like a free, really easy to use, like basic e-wallet. Um, and uh, they transferred me the Bitcoins, and I went to the site and looked, and I had six Bitcoins, and I thought, oh, cool, all right, well, even if this whole Bitcoin thing goes nowhere, I have, like, this cool souvenir of something interesting, so whatever. Then, like, four days later, I went to my Bitcoin uh, to check on my Bitcoins again, and it, the whole website was gone. It was, just not, it was just not there. I, like, typed it into my browser, and it was like, we don't know what you're talking about. Um, so I was like, uh, <laughs> what's going on? And a lot of other people were asking the same question because it was a very popular service. Like I mentioned, it was easy to use and it was free. Um, so uh, people were really angry. Where's, where, what happened to this website? What happened to my money? Um, then like a week later, they put up this announcement. Basically they said, oh, we got hacked. Sorry, <laughs> we're shutting down. Uh, we're refunding half of everyone's deposits. Um, so this was kind of like the first of a series of like bad things that happened to Bitcoin. Uh, there was another major hacker attack where a hacker uh, broke into the account of an individual and took almost half a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. There was a, a major exchange that had a flash crash, just like the New York Stock Exchange flash crash, um, when a hacker broke in and put in a sell order, a massive sell order that crashed the market and sent the price of Bitcoin from $17 to one cent in one day. So with all of this happening, people started to think like, um, is Bitcoin safe? Like who, who are these people uh, who I'm, are keeping my money? Um, there was another exchange that uh, was based in Poland and the owner accidentally deleted the file with everyone's Bitcoins. So needless to say, the Bitcoin price started to go down. This is the Bitcoin price uh, from the beginning to last week. Uh, so basically it went from $33 to the Bitcoin to under $4 uh, in four months. So then the media is like, oh, Bitcoin's dead. They started to write Bitcoin's obituary. Uh, so that's the end of Bitcoin then. That's my favorite. Everything is going wrong at the same time for controversial virtual currency Bitcoin. 
So is Bitcoin fool's gold? Uh, I think what this shows is that there are advantages and disadvantages to Bitcoin. Um, you have anonymity, which is great, uh, but uh, it's, it makes it um, difficult to audit uh, transactions, difficult to verify who people are. Um, de decentralization versus usability. So anybody can start a Bitcoin exchange. Anybody can you know, start making Bitcoins. Um, but this also means that nothing in the Bitcoin economy looks the same. There are like 12 different logos for it. Um, and it's kind of hard for people who are new to the currency to start using it, especially if they're not that technical. Independence versus legality. So uh, I've called it anarchist before. Um, so it's great to have an independent currency that's not beholden to any government. But at the same time, uh, there's no legal authority to you know, there's no one for those Bitcoin thieves to answer to besides the FBI. Somebody called the FBI. I don't think they're doing anything about it. Um, and then also, because it's operating outside the system, it doesn't have the blessing of any government. You know, in America, it's illegal to start a currency that competes with the dollar. If the American government decided to go after Bitcoin, that could very easily just crush the whole Bitcoin economy right there. Um, so Bitcoin is in beta. Uh, it's... The largest Bitcoin exchange only has 51,000 users, so it's never been tested on a large scale. That same security expert who said that it was really well-written code also said that it would have problems if it got to a massive scale. This is the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, a New York venture capitalist posted this on his blog um, in a like very boostery post about Bitcoin. Um, so this is a theory from a research firm Gartner based in the US, uh, their idea is that when a new technology is introduced that's really disruptive, at first there's like this hype, people get overexcited, investors throw money at it um, until it, it gets, to, it crests. And then uh, people think they've been disappointed. They think the technology hasn't moved fast enough, it's not being adopted fast enough, and they s abandon it. But uh, there are still people in businesses who keep the faith. They keep working on it, keep evolving it and making it better, using it until it gets to the point where it's, you know, in wide use and indispensable, potentially. This was a blurry picture from my phone uh, at the Bitcoin World Conference and Expo in New York in August. Um, that's Gavin Andreessen, the lead developer on the Bitcoin project, talking. He gave the keynote. Uh, and the interesting thing that he said was, um, we need to make Bitcoin boring. So uh, Gavin Andreessen was really unhappy with all the press coverage that Bitcoin had gotten. He thought it was like, you know, it was, it was kind of like a soap opera. It was a lot about drama and it was making the price go jump all around. And he said, that's not what we need. What we need is people to use Bitcoin to buy and sell things and keep working on it and identifying problems with it and evolving it. and evangelizing it, you know, just to their friends. So uh, this is that same price chart again. Um, and you can see it's gotten kind of, I mean, it's more boring than it was uh, over the summer, certainly, although it's still very volatile. But uh, the interesting thing about this chart is it also includes the volume. Um, so you can see that even though the price is much lower, the volume of trades is much higher. So there's uh, a lot more activity around Bitcoin now than there was over the summer. Um, and there are also still lots of people who are really into Bitcoin. Uh, I actually met another presenter last night, um, Mark Supps, or I don't know how to say his last name, but uh, he's presenting about a nuclear reactor he's building in Brooklyn. Um, but <laughs> he actually owns a bunch of Bitcoin and is also building a Bitcoin ATM to dispense US dollars for Bitcoin. Um, there are, uh, there's like a, a Bitcoin stock exchange being built for, so you can trade uh, Bitcoin startups stock. Um, the Silk Road, that website where you can buy drugs with Bitcoin, is booming. They're actually hiring a customer service rep. That's not even a joke. Uh, people are still accepting Bitcoin. Uh, when Occupy were asking for Bitcoin donations, they were really into the Bitcoin idea. Um, another challenge for Bitcoin, though, is that it has a lot of competition. Um, so a lot of this was in the previous presentation. Uh, there are actually um, Bitcoin variations. So people who didn't like this or that about Bitcoin copied the whole code because it's all public and open source. 
and just made little tweaks and came up with their own virtual currencies. I think Namecoin is the most, is the biggest. Um, Diwala is a US-based startup that does payments with really low fees and peer-to-peer -peer payments. Uh, Facebook credits, obviously Facebook would love to be the universal currency on the internet. Um, and also there are other startups that are replicating like little features of Bitcoin that people like, like just the peer-to-peer -peer payments or just being able to make payments over your phone. Um, so uh, people always ask me, um, so like what's the answer to Bitcoin? Like is it dead? What's, what's going to happen to it? Um, was, it ever, was it ever a real thing? Uh, so I'll attempt to give my analysis. Um, I think that uh, Bitcoin is still is going to remain too uh, hard to use to ever become popular in the mainstream. I think that as e-payments evolve, which they're doing really quickly, um, people will use solutions like Google Wallet and Facebook credits before they use Bitcoin. Like the draw of anonymity is not strong enough to overcome the inconvenience of using Bitcoin. Um, but I think it's possible that Bitcoin could continue to exist. Um, maybe it'll be used just with a small community, like, um, like uh, not much bigger than the community that's using it now, but more consistently. I could see it coexisting alongside uh, traditional currencies and PayPal and Bank of America and everybody else. Um, and if it stayed small like that, that, then it could also stay under the radar and not get shut down by the US government. Um, but anyway, I don't really know, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I just think it's a fun story, and it's not over yet. Um, so that's my talk. Thank you very much. You can get at me on Twitter. My email address is there if you have any additional questions about Bitcoin. Take, take the applause, and then what did you mean? Oh, I said my email address is on my Twitter if you have additional questions about Bitcoin. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, you say that we don't know who invented Bitcoin, right? Right, it's still, actually the New Yorker uh, magazine had an investigative reporter look into this and try to figure it out, and he failed. What's his name? It out. The reporter? The, no, the, the, the inventor of Bitcoin? Satoshi Nakamoto. He's here with us? That would be great, no? <laughs> uh -huh. That would be and amazing. Then the guy would, he would come down dressed as a ninja. and. Uh... <laughs> you should get him for next year. Yeah, that would be really cool. You would have um, sell out for sure. Adrian, I, I don't want to get in, uh, into technical details, but uh, one thing that I still don't understand, and I've been following Bitcoin for a while, and uh, I have an email account, so um, I can use a computer, <laughs> um, is how does it work concretely? Like, you, you want to join the Bitcoin world, so you, you download the software, right? Mm -hmm. This is where you start. There's a software, there's like a Bitcoin client, Bit uh, yourself, yeah, when, you, when you bought Bitcoin, you went to a place? When I bought Bitcoin, well, I just signed up at mybitcoin.com, which was like the, the easy, this is the problem with Bitcoin, is because it's hard to get in. Um, so, uh, so you put your you credit card need, details? Yeah, I mean, you can and use you one of the, uh, well, w when I just bought it at cash, so I but gave cash But they send you a file, it. which, your yeah, Bitcoins are a file, okay. Yeah, so each Bitcoin is a file. Um, well, it's a bit of code, yeah. Okay, so it's kind of a code that yeah, you Yeah, so you can store like your Bitcoins on your hard drive if you wanted to. And it's like a string of letters yeah. and okay, that cannot be copied. Yeah. And so the, the whole thing was... But uh, you can also, you can buy it on one of the exchanges, in which it's really easy to do and they'll just keep it for you. So, so when you went to that uh, pizza or kebab place, how, how would you pay? You would like spell uh, like A, B, C, you know? Like <laughs> well, so six. Bitcoin is very popular with a lot of people who know how to program. So there are lots of tools around it. And there are lots of like, there are so many Android apps for it. Um, mm. Like I had a, a Bitcoin stock ticker, like price ticker on my phone for a while. Um, so they had, I think they had a, an app that they just transferred. I gave them my address. You have a, a Bitcoin address. Um, and I gave that to them and they transferred it to me. And everybody who's looked at that piece of technology say that it's really brilliant, right? The technology right. itself is really brilliant. And Supposedly. so there is that concept that I found fascinating that the, 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 the number of Bitcoins is limited in time. And to, so to create Bitcoins, you have to solve very complex mathematical programs. Right. And the more uh, Bitcoins there are, the more complex the problems become. So the harder right. it becomes to generate new money. But right. the programmer wanted to simulate the growth of a monetary mass right into Bitcoins. It's a really, really interesting uh, topic. Thank you very much for making it clear and telling us the story. Adrian Jeffries. Thank you. Jeffries. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone.